Hello and welcome to Back to the Science. I'm Dr. Susan Oliver and I'm a scientist and this is Cindy Oliver and she's a dog. Last week I published a video which covered how pea hacking and apples to oranges comparisons had been used in a preprint paper to make it seem that vaccines actually caused more harm than good. I also shared a link to the video on Twitter and a few people very kindly shared the link. A few days later, I woke up to find I had a ridiculous number of notifications on Twitter. As I read through them, I realised that the majority were related to a series of tweets about me from Professor Norman Benton. Let's have a look at those tweets. He starts off, one, I can only assume that the professors who retweeted this video that attempts to discredit Peter Doshi's paper did not actually watch it. It's embarrassing. He then goes on to say, this is a tweet with the video link if you want to have a good laugh, followed by, she's a very serious scientist, and a screenshot of a tweet I had previously made about a clinical trial that was looking into the benefits of using a vibrator to achieve orgasm on sexual function, pelvic prolapse, urinary continence, and other measures of pelvic and sexual health. And he finally finished with, for I wouldn't normally publicly criticise other scientists, but I now make an exception for self-declared fact checker Pfizer Shields like at Dr. Susan Oliver One, at Gid MK, at Kay Sheldricks, who devote their energy to trying to discredit real scientists, many of whom are my colleagues. Now, I must say, when I read the final tweet, I was rather chuffed because the other scientists that he is referring to are Gideon Meyerwitz Katz and Dr. Kyle Sheldrick, both of whom are very well-known scientists who do an excellent job of debunking scientific information. So being mentioned in the same tweet as them was pretty cool. Although Sydney was a bit miffed that she didn't get a mention, which is possibly why she's trying to make her presence felt a bit more in this video. A little later, Dr. David Gorski wrote an excellent post which further detailed the issues with the paper, as well as providing more information on Peter Doshi's general vaccine misinformation. And he added a tweet about it in response to Professor Fenton's thread. And I'll provide a link to that post in the video description so that you can read it for yourselves. Now, a number of people pointed out to Professor Fenton that his criticisms of me lacked substance and he hadn't actually critiqued anything in my video. So he prepared a blog post that he claims covers what is wrong with my video. Both Dr. David Gorski and Dr. Jonathan Howard have responded to Professor Fenton's blog and have noted several issues with it. I'll provide links to both of these articles in the video description so you can read them for yourselves. However, given that his blog post was focused heavily on me, I thought I should also respond. So let's have a look at Professor Fenton's blog. Now, the first strange claim he makes is the following. She refers to the paper as the Doshi paper. And we will use the same reference here, even though Doshi is the last rather than first named author. Now, I was quite surprised to see this claim, firstly, because I've never actually referred to the paper as the Doshi paper, although obviously I have stated that Peter Doshi was an author, as did Professor Fenton in his tweets. And secondly, Peter Doshi is actually the corresponding author. And for those of you who don't know, that's why his name was last, because the corresponding author traditionally is listed last in the author list. And I find it rather surprising that Professor Fenton appears not to know this. Anyway, for simplicity, I'll also now refer to the paper as the Doshi paper. So the next criticism of my video by Professor Fenton is here. Now, firstly, he seems to not be happy with how long I've spent on various segments in the video, whatever. But then he goes on to claim that the Doshi paper is not an example of p-hacking at all. 
in bold. And his reasoning here appears to be because they don't use p-values. As I mentioned in my original video about the paper, p-hacking occurs when researchers collect or select data or statistical analyses until non-significant results become significant. There is no need to actually show p-values to show statistical significance. Professor Fenton also claims that they make no claims at all of statistical significance. Now, here he's just being cute. Included in the blog post is Table 2, which you can see here. As you can see, they include 95% confidence intervals for both risk difference and risk ratio. Now, any scientist will tell you if the risk difference confidence interval doesn't include zero, it's statistically significant. And if the risk ratio confidence interval doesn't include one, it's also statistically significant. So the authors are inferring statistical significance, even if they don't spell it out. And quite frankly, if the results didn't show statistical significance, they couldn't make the claims they are making. Fenton then says, Susan then claims that only by combining the data from the different trials does Doshi get the mythically claimed significant results and that such combining should simply not be done. This is one of her apples and oranges comparison argument. Blah, blah, blah. Professor Fenton really should have paid a bit more attention to my video because I never said that such combining should simply not be done. I just pointed out that the only way the results are statistically significant for the serious adverse events of special interest is if the results are combined. And it also wasn't one of my apples to oranges comparisons. In fact, Professor Fenton completely ignored the main apple to oranges comparison that I covered in my video. But more on that later. Fenton then goes on to address what he claims are my final criticisms of the paper. They're not my final criticisms. He ignored those. But anyway, let's have a look at what he says. Susan's final criticisms of the Doshi paper concerns the selection of SAEs and the possibility of double counting. Regarding selection, the events included and not included are governed by the who endorsed Brighton scheme and are not decided by the authors. So this is a critical error Susan makes. The Brighton list was created a priori based on data before the any results were released from the trials. Okay, so here is a list of adverse events of special interest as identified by the Brighton Collaboration. And here is a list of serious adverse events of special interest from Doshi's preprint. You may want to stop the video and go back and compare the list, but if you don't have time, I'll give you the bottom line. Doshi et al. chose to not use a list of adverse events of special interest that were included in the Brighton collaboration. They decided to add a bunch of other adverse events that the Brighton collaboration didn't think should be included. They then took it one step further and went through all the serious adverse events from the trials and arbitrarily decided whether they fit in with the list of serious adverse events that they had made. And as Dr. Gorski has noted, some of those decisions are rather questionable. He notes, one thing stood out, namely that all chest pain, cardiac and non-cardiac was mapped to myocarditis slash pericarditis, while all upper abdominal pain was mapped to colitis slash enteritis. In other words, the authors made events fit in with their modified Brighton list without any proof that they actually did. So the authors may have fooled Fenton into thinking that they use the Brighton criteria, but they haven't fooled everyone. Fenton then goes on to say, further regarding double counting, SAEs are counted individually to avoid them being hidden. So if you get renal failure and then your penis drops off, that should be two SAEs, not one. Now, I'll just stop there for a minute. If you've seen my previous video about vaccines being the leading cause of coincidence, 
you may remember that quite a large number of people had left their reports about the vaccine that concerned their penises. And I did remark at the time that there seemed to be a bit of a penis obsession. Well, it appears that Professor Fenton has the same penis obsession. It really is quite bizarre that he's brought up his penis to make this point because penis dropping off is neither on the Brighton list or on the modified list prepared by the authors of the preprint. He then goes on to suggest that one person having three serious adverse events could be considered as serious as three people having a stroke and further suggests that I don't appear to understand what a serious adverse event is. Well, I'm not a clinician, but Dr Gorski is, and he's also a scientist. So let's see what he thinks. As Dr Gorski makes clear, a serious adverse event is any adverse event that is grade three or higher. And uh, grade three is defined as an adverse event that is severe or medically significant, but not immediately life-threatening, or requires hospitalisation or prolongation of hospitalisation indicated, or limits self-care or activities of daily living. He then goes on to say, so no, as a general principle, it is not true that someone suffering three SAEs is necessarily as big a deal as three people suffering a single SAE each. It might be less severe, it might be more severe. It might suggest similar severity. Which of these three possibilities is the case all depends on the specific SAEs in the clinical trial subjects being considered. I would argue that it is not Susan Oliver who doesn't understand AEs and SAEs, but rather Norman Fenton. He then provides a very good analysis of the so-called Bayesian analysis, which was done by Professor Fenton. And you can read that in the article after you finish watching this video. The most telling part about Professor Fenton's blog about my video, though, is what he didn't critique. A major issue that I had identified with the Doshi preprint was the apples to oranges comparison that they did between adverse events from a large group of people who got the vaccine and COVID hospitalization figures from a small group of people who had got COVID during the trial. And this article here by Dr. Jonathan Howard, who is a clinician who has actually treated COVID patients, explains in a lot more detail why this was just a ridiculous comparison to make. As Dr. Howard explains, we must now acknowledge two key points. First, depending on how quickly a virus spreads, the benefits of a vaccine can take many months, even years to accumulate. Second, nearly all vaccine harms occur shortly after vaccination. Someone who analysed the RCTs after one week would find the vaccine caused a bunch of sore arms and fevers while preventing zero cases of COVID. In all vaccine RCTs, the vaccine's harms are front-loaded while its benefits accrue over time. Just look at those famous graphs from the COVID RCTs to see how obvious this is. He also rightly points out that we have information on the safety and efficacy of the COVID vaccines from observational studies as well as RCTs, and that both should be considered. As he points out, there is no shortage of such studies. The evidence is overwhelming that COVID vaccines keep people alive and out of hospital. Only someone who starts with the conclusion that vaccines don't work and then works backwards to find the evidence could claim otherwise. Now, finally, I'd like to mention something that was picked up by Professor Greg Tucker Kellogg, who some of you may know has an excellent YouTube channel that debunks a lot of misinformation. And I'll provide a link to his channel in the video's description so you can check it out if you haven't already. This is what Professor Tucker Kellogg noted. It's a revealing choice you've made to refer to Dr. Oliver as Susan throughout your blog post and every other author by their surname. 
Now, to be honest, I hadn't picked up on this before Professor Tucker Kellogg mentioned it. Unfortunately, I'm so used to sexism and classism, I've just learned to tune it out. The classism, by the way, is because I grew up in a working class suburb. I went to a government school. A lot of people seem to think that means I'm beneath them. But I shouldn't have to tune this out and neither should other people who share my gender or upbringing. And of course, neither should people who experience this type of behaviour owing to their race, sexuality, religion or anything else. Professor Tucker Kellogg is correct and I appreciate him highlighting it as well as everyone else who has offered their support to me both publicly and privately. Anyway, I think we've wasted more than enough time on Professor Fenton now. If you'd like to look further into the data that I've presented, I've provided links in the video's description. And please remember, this video is about the science, but you shouldn't take it as medical advice. For that, you should speak to your medical practitioner. Thank you for listening. If you found the video useful, please hit the like button because that will mean that YouTube will share it with more people. And if you'd like to see more videos about the science in the future, please hit the subscribe button. Thank you.